So my name is Francesca. I am one of the partner managers here at ShipBob. I manage the logistics and supply chain partners. Um, and really excited to have Fredos. They've been a partner of ours for a long time, just helping our merchants um, get their inventory from point A to point B. So I'm really excited to introduce Judah, head of research at Fredos.com. And like I said, Fredos.com is the largest digital freight platform. Similar to like when you're shopping for flights, it's super easy to use. Um, and connecting logistics providers um, with merchants to help them get their inv inventory imported or exported. Um, over 12,000 SMEs and enterprise organizations have sourced shipping services through Fredos. And together with ShipBob, um, we've helped merchants get their inventory from point A to point B. So don't forget, ask your questions in the chat um, if you have anything, because we'll answer them after at the end of the session. And then an icebreaker question for everyone. How many of you are ready shipping internationally? Where do most of your orders come from? Drop that in the chat. Um, so without further ado, I'll let Judah take it from here. Great. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, as Fran said, I'm Judah Levine. I'm head of research at uh, Fredos Group. Um, and uh, the point of this session is really as we are closed 2021 or heading into 2022, um, to take a look back at uh, kind of the year in logistics, um, try and give some indication of what the uh, what this year may look like, and also look at some of the feedback and data we've uh, we've seen in terms of how the pandemic has been, um, or in the, the logistics disruptions have been uh, impacting um, importers and exporters, especially small businesses and many of them uh, e-commerce businesses. Um, and also look some of the, at some of the best practices that we've learned at Fredos uh, over the course of the last um, year and a half. So before we get started, if I just give a, a, another word about Fredos. Um, so the Fredos group, we like to call ourselves the, or think of ourselves as the global freight booking platform um, or kind of the digital backbone for, for logistics. And essentially um, we're a logistics technology company that's building connections between the different parts of the supply chain. So if we look at Fredos.com, um, that's our online marketplace where we connect uh, thousands of shippers, importers, and exporters with dozens of freight forwarders so they can book um, multimodal freight uh, online, like the way we've become accustomed of uh, booking uh, travel. Um, we also have Web Cargo, which connects uh, ocean air carriers with, um, with freight forwarders. Um, and then also it facilitates the sharing of information, the sharing of freight data, specifically um, uh, uh, rates and the ability for forwarders to book digitally with, with carriers. In addition, we also have a unit called Fredos Data. Um, and as we have these different touch points between different parts of the, of the uh, uh, stakeholders in the supply chain, we also have a lot of visibility on forwarder behavior, on shipper behavior, which gives us some insights into what's going on. And as I said, these different connections also have a lot to do with freight rates. And that brings us to our Fredos Baltic Index, which is a, uh, an index of, um, uh, and ocean container spot rates. Um, and we can really get a, a good sense of the story of the last year and a half from here. So, um, so if we start with ocean freight, as we know by now, the main driver of uh, disruptions and also of the, of the spiking rates has been the shift in consumer behavior. So um, really uh, starting in June, 2020, a year and a half ago, there was this real shift in uh, spending from services to goods, as we all have been you know, spending more time at home, less ability to spend on travel and uh, entertainment and, and uh, restaurants and things like that. There's been a big increase on spending on, on goods. And so if we look at um, the beginning of kind of the, the shift in, in logistics during the pandemic, uh, ocean rates doubled as this pandemic spending on goods started. Um, last June between uh, over the course of the summer. And that seemed like a really significant increase at the time. And as we've seen um, since then, or as we can see, um, really since then, the rates have just continued climbing. And that main driver is this shift in, uh, in spending on goods. So if we uh, talk about um, in the yellow and orange lines are Asia to the, to the US or China to, to the US to both coasts, um, Volumes for the U.S. For in 2021 were 20 percent higher than they were in 2019. So it was a, a tremendous increase uh, in, in goods. Um, and, uh, and as we can see from the chart, um, it wasn't just uh, this this underlying um, increase in demand, but then there was one kind of crisis or disruption after the other. First was an empty container shortage directly uh, related to that competition for uh, for equipment. 
um, as, um, as we had this uh, increase in demand, uh, those blue lines are, are Asia to Europe. Uh, then, as we know, we had the disruption in the Suez last March. In, um, in this past summer in Yanshan, there was an outbreak of corona, which uh, significantly slowed down that major uh, export port in, in China. Um, and then we have a tremendous spike, um, specifically on the Trans-Pacific from Asia to the, to the US, in this past peak season. So peak season, there's always an increase in demand. There's always an increase in prices. But this was kind of supercharged this year as we saw rates spike 70% to more than $20,000 per container, when normally containers cost around $1,500 per, per container on the spot market. We saw a decrease, a significant decrease um, after peak season in, in November, about 25%. Um, but since then, rates have stayed extremely elevated, about $15,000 per, uh, per container, which again is kind of 10 times the norm. Um, and now as we head into Lunar New Year, when a lot of manufacturing shuts down in, in China, um, there's also normally some increase in demand, increase in rates. And we've seen kind of a, a moderate increase over the last couple of weeks. But again, rates have stayed so um, elevated because of this nonstop increase um, or shift in demand. And so, you know, what's driving uh, all this, uh, all these elevated rates uh, is, as we said, this increase in demand. If we look at the chart on the right in gray, this are, these are uh, imports from Asia to, uh, to the US. And uh, a typical year would look kind of like peaks and valleys. Um, there'll be different lulls and in uh, an increase in volumes towards, uh, towards peak season. And as we can see um, uh, really for much of last year, uh, uh, demand and volumes were extremely elevated and there was no real easing up. And what that does, and if we look on our right, that ca causes a tremendous amount of congestion. So it's fairly easy to move um, ocean capacity around, to move shifts on to different lanes, um, you know, uh, to, to uh, bring the ocean capacity to where demand is. But um, port capacity is is much more finite and can't be uh, adjusted as quickly. And here we're looking at um, the number of ships that are waiting to for a spot to open up outside the ports of LA Long Beach. This is a snapshot by marine traffic from the end of December. If we look currently, it looks not quite as bad. But if you were to zoom out, you would see that there's actually more ships waiting because there's been a change in, um, in policies in terms of how many ships can be waiting directly off bay for kind of pollution reasons and safety reasons. So there is at this point, there's more than 100 ships waiting and that number has grown. So that, uh, that demand has pushed rates way up, it's caused congestion. And of course, when there's congestion, it slows down um, the process of getting containers moved. And so that's led to delays as well. Here we're looking at a chart of the um, average monthly, uh, the average for each month of how long end-to-end uh, -end ocean freight took for, um, uh, for shippers who booked on Freitas.com platform. And we see that in January, right, the number has just continued to grow. In January, the average number of days it took end-to-end uh, -end from China to the U.S. was 82 days. Whereas if we look um, kind of pre-pandemic, the norm was more in the, the, the low to mid-40s. So there's been a, a tremendous increase in the amount of time it's taking, it's taking for, um, for shipments to arrive. And, you know, it's not just the ocean part. So there's a lot of talk about what's been going on in, in L.A. and Long Beach. Um, and it's really, uh, it's not just the ability to uh, unload containers and get them moving, but there's a lot of different moving parts and they're all interrelated and all of them are really um, uh, overextended with the, with the nonstop peak season, really. Um, every year during peak season, there'll be back up. And then when things come, the backlogs um, are cleared and there really hasn't been a chance to do that this year. So. At LA and Long Beach, there's problems with space on the container yard itself. There's not there's stacked up imports. There are empty containers that need to be removed. And when there's not enough room in the in the container yard, then there's not then uh, the arriving ships can't be unloaded that quickly because there's nowhere to put the containers. The containers need to be moved off. Um, this backs up into trucking. There are trucking shortages. There are trucking uh, equipment shortages because of of uh, all the empty containers and other sorts of containers in the uh, taking up warehouse space in the region. Um, there's also shortage of truck drivers and equipment. Uh, at various times, there have been backups in rail. So it's kind of all interconnected and all uh, overstretched, both because of this um, you know, nonstop uh, uh, elevated volumes and also because of the way that the, that the uh, virus itself has impacted different parts of the labor 
uh, workforce in different places um, from, in different times. Um, so if we shift a moment to air cargo, uh, it's a similar story and you know, very uh, elevated rates, but uh, slightly different um, drivers here. So in air cargo, uh, there has been an increase in demand. It wasn't as dramatic as uh, an ocean or as dramatic right away, but there is increased demand, especially on, on certain specific lanes like the Trans-Pacific, like China Key West. But a big driver here is that in normal circumstances, about 50% of air cargo will travel by passenger jet. And as we know during the pandemic, excuse me, um, as we know during the pandemic, passenger travel has been um, significantly impacted. And this big decrease in the number of passenger flights that are flying also decreases available capacity. Um, at the same time, we also have some of this increase in demand. So if we look towards the, the beginning of the pandemic, there, there was a rush on, on PPE, and that pushed uh, air freights extremely elevated um, over a short period of time, and those rates came down. But we see even since then, there's been up and downs, but rates have continued to be extremely elevated. Here we're looking at Asia to the, uh, to the US West Coast. And as we see, as we saw uh, kind of demand recover, um, we see rates continue to climb. And then we had a significant increase over um, the course of peak season, which is a little bit later for, for air cargo. Um, but even after peak season, rates have come down, but they're still, you know, a triple what they are uh, in normal circumstances. And again, this is because we have this lack of capacity, we have an increase in demand, um, and uh, as, as passenger capacity is still uh, very compromised, that's going to continue to be a problem. In addition, um, uh, the kind of the, the virus and COVID itself is also having uh, impacts in, uh, in air, maybe in a more pronounced way than an ocean, because um, there are different quarantine rules for different uh, air crews in different countries. So spe specifically in China um, and, and in Hong Kong, there have been uh, kind of strict quarantine rules for, rules for crews that want to uh, are based in certain cities and want to, um, you know, kind of leave the airport. It becomes very complicated. Um, there's also been a big impact on ground handling. So ground handling, there's been a big labor shortage, which has been complicated by, by quarantine rules, has been complicated by people getting sick or having to, uh, or being exposed and having to quarantine. Um, so we've seen um, congestion that is caused by uh, decreased uh, workforces, both in kind of Asian origins and also uh, in destination airports in the US and also in Europe. Um, just this week, uh, Lufthansa suspended uh, cargo operations in their hub in Frankfurt because um, the workforce just, uh, you know, there was just a real shortage of labor because of um, the, you know, so many uh, positive cases among their workforce. Um, and that's something we've seen, you know, off and on many times more in, uh, in air cargo. So, um, so uh, we kind of looked overall at the, the way that the demand increases have impacted um, air cargo, has impacted ocean freight, um, and how is this impacting shippers themselves? So as I said, we also have the opportunity to uh, not only see how uh, shippers, importers, exporters on our platform are behaving, but also to ask them how this, uh, you know, how, how these, uh, this last year has really impacted them in their, in their business. Um, and so we sent a survey to, to our um, uh, to our shippers on our on our platform to ask them how they've um, kind of fared during the pandemic. We did this for the first time a year ago, and then we did it two more times once in uh, June of last year, and then again in November. And what we saw is, as we can see, kind of you know even a year ago, um, almost eighty percent of respondents said they were impacted in in some negative way by the by the pandemic. Uh, but this time in in November, excuse me. Um, nearly everybody, right? 93% said that they had some kind of negative impact on their, uh, on their business from logistics. And how has that been impacting them? So we see that one of the things is that a lot of businesses have had to increase prices, partially because of this impact in, uh, or this increase in, in ocean costs. So as costs have, have gone up, a lot of businesses have had to pass on those um, those, uh, those growing costs to their customers. And we said this is very pronounced, has gotten to 64%. So um, uh, nearly two, uh, more than two thirds uh, in November, whereas back a year ago, it was only closer to a third. And some businesses have also had to reduce their margins in, a different to, in addition to increasing their, their prices. 
We also found that uh, small businesses are often impacted more significantly than larger businesses. So when we asked, when we compared uh, large importers to small importers, we saw large importers more often uh, were able to raise prices, um, which may mean that they have kind of, uh, you know, uh, goods in higher demand. We saw that smaller importers were more likely to have to reduce their margins in addition, maybe for many of them to increase in their prices. Um, we also saw that increased good, increased demand was experienced by large importers more than small importers. Again, this might be to their, um, uh, you know, a more diversified offering or, or things like that. Um, and then we also found that uh, small importers were much more likely to have shipped less over the last um, six months or year because of these impacts, whereas larger businesses did not. And so this just points to, you know, the sometimes the resources or the um, uh, the resiliency of, uh, of smaller businesses are not the same as big businesses, which brings us to uh, kind of our, our last couple points. Um, the first question is when will these kind of, when will the, the trends turn? When will things go back to normal? So the, the real answer is the demand increase that's been driving all these problems. Once that demand recedes to more normal uh, levels, then there'll be an opportunity to clear the backlogs and that's when things will go back to normal. When will that be is an extremely difficult question to answer. So as we said, um, we have Lunar New Year just now, um, and we saw not such a huge increase before. It would be likely there's not such a big increase after as there's uh, a clear the whatever uh, typical backlogs there were. But looking forward, um, the first thing to look at is Omicron itself. How is it going to impact logistics? So the long if Omicron uh, proves to kind of um, uh, increase or prolong this uh, consumer spending on, on goods and keeping people away from spending on services, and then they're spending those money on goods that travel by ocean or air, um, then, Omicron, then you know, Omicron is gonna have the, the effect of pushing uh, the recovery that, that much further back. Um, then again, if it, as we see, it's been very fast and furious, and if it's starting to recede, and if it's the beginning of the end because of you know, different, uh, the different ways it is, uh, um, it may be the start of the recovery because so many people have been exposed and, uh, and things like that, especially in the U.S. So that could possibly, you know, show the beginning of this shift. Um, on the other hand, if it impacts logistics in China, where there's a very different approach to, um, to controlling the pandemic, um, if it starts to impact um, workforces at the ports themselves, then that will also cause disruption. So, so far, there have been um, small outbreaks in lots of places. Uh, the measures so far have have uh, kept logistics more or less intact. If there's an outbreak at a port itself, like we saw this past summer in Yanchen, so um, then that could have a negative impact. And then finally, the other thing is inventory levels. So even once consumer spending goes back to normal, um, U.S. retail consumer levels are at nearly record lows. And so once that spending uh, goes back to, to services, there's still going to be a period of restocking that will take several months and will keep ocean volumes higher than normal. And again, we'll, we'll um, kind of push back when we can get those um, that backlog, backlog cleared. So all those things taken together, the expectations really by most observers is that we aren't gonna see a real um, beginning of recovery or getting back to more normal levels until after peak season of next of this year. So we have you know a few months after Lunar New Year until peak season begins in about July, August. Uh, peak season starts to recede in November, and that's kind of the earliest that we could expect to see things um, hopefully improve. And then finally, I know this is a, a lot for a short amount of time. The other thing we wanted to share is um, what are some of the best practices that we've learned over this uh, this period in terms of, you know, okay, everything's a mess, but what's the way, kind of what are the best practices, what, what's the best we can do given this bad situation? Um, so the first thing is that large importers and small importers are kind of both in the same boat in the sense that you know even giant importers like uh, ikea or, or walmart are looking for ways to uh, uh you know to kind of mitigate the disruptions the giants are are chartering their own uh, ocean uh, the uh, container ships which isn't a reality for most people but it just shows that everyone is kind of suffering um and so what we found in this in our surveys is that a lot of shippers are trying a lot of different things so when we put it in front of them a lot of different options have you used more forwarders less forwarders more ocean carriers different modes the answer was yes to all of them about a third had said yes to, to each of these very different options 
But here are what some of our experts at, at Freitas um, say are some of the things we can do to mitigate. The first is to mix it up, to diversify in different ways. Um, so on Freitas.com, you can go and you can search at different origins in, in different destinations. If you have flexibility of using one coast over the other, we've recently seen a shift towards uh, East Coast volumes in some of the, some of the data. Um, you can, if you have flexibility or sending some shipments to one place and some to others, that's a good um, way, uh, a good strategy to try and uh, 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 see which uh, methods would, would uh, might have more availability or shorter transit times or things like that. The other thing is to mix it up with modes. So as we said, air is very expensive. Ocean is also very expensive. And actually the gap between air and ocean has closed. Um, if it's possible to prioritize certain parts of certain shipments and send them by air, whereas you would normally send by ocean, that has been a good strategy for some people. The other thing is in ocean shipments, there's a FCL full container load and also LCL. And we've seen a lot of uh, generally FCL shippers breaking up um, shipments into smaller LCL shipments, um, which sometimes has better availability with uh, the consolidators who do, who do LCL. So that's another option. Um, the other uh, tip was to budget a buffer. So to understand if they, you know, and uh, we know everyone is, is stretched, but to understand that there is a, um, uh, there is the unexpected. So kind of expect the unexpected. And if you can budget that into your, um, to your costs and your expectations of arrival time, um, that is also going to be to your advantage. Uh, and then finally book early. So kind of part of the reason that peak season was so, um, uh, long and, and kind of extreme is because of the experiences and even the year before a lot of retailers were ordering for peak season early so pulled peak season early but because of that increased demand it was spread out over a longer period of time so in, in some sense it's a self-fulfilling prophecy but given the the reality of the delays if you can um, kind of estimate your uh your logistics ahead of time and send things earlier than you normally would that is another good uh strategy that we've heard from um we have a lot of other great resources a couple of places you can look. One is ship.2 slash outlook 2022, where we have uh, resources that um, uh, I kind of put together data points on what this year um, could look like. We have videos there from different freight forwarders who sell on our marketplace, giving you their expert opinions. Um, we also have ship.2 slash corona updates, where we have uh, an updated page on what's going on in ocean freight, uh, uh, what's going on in logistics. And you could also, um, sign up for our uh, weekly update at fbx.freitas.com. You get access to our FBX ocean rates, uh, air rates there as well. And you also get a, a my weekly update on what's going on in freight.